Welcome back to the Movement Professional Podcast. Good to see you again, Dr. Richards. Good to, good to be here, Dr. Live. How are you holding up? I'm doing well. Uh, good, happy Friday. Eagles won. It's been a little rocky so far, but 2-0. <laughs> I know. Tough 2-0, though. Like, yeah. some more injuries. I saw Avante Maddox is yeah. likely out for indefinitely. Mm. So that stinks. But, yeah, a little rocky. Passing looked pretty rocky, but... DeAndre Swift had a great game and they oh. looked great rushing. So that was I love fun. it. Yeah, I think they I think they need to go there and then work around the rushing game, but and then the passing game will follow because they it did look a little bit better at the end. I mean, Jalen was had some decently accurate throws at um at the end, but yeah, they I just think they look a little une- uneasy yeah. and like uncertain is yeah. the way that it felt early on. But yeah, the running game was dominant. So yeah, I like saw Swift had 175 yards, but a hundred over 130 of those were before contact. So yeah. like the O line was just moving it, people, which, which is, is cool. Yeah, they gotta they gotta lean on that. And uh, DeAndre Swift is on my fantasy bench in both of my leagues, by the way. So well, I'm not even upset <laughs> about it, but because like I I actually took a little bit of a risk on him, thinking okay he might pan out, but I was waiting to see when he would pan out. Well, he yeah. has, so he's on my bench but he might not be next week. <laughs> nice. Nice. And yeah, I was watching the Kelsey documentary that just came mm-hmm. out too. So that's, that's got me all juiced up. So yeah, now we're in the swing of it. Yeah. It was, that's a solid documentary. I'm, I'm obsessed with sports documentaries. That's one of the better ones. Then. Yeah. I have two, actually. I watched the Florida Gators untold mm-hmm. and that yeah. was, that was like, act, that was actually insane. Yeah. The things that, that flew there. Like, yeah, it, yeah that was nuts. I have no words for that. We, we could do a whole podcast on sports documentaries. Maybe we will sometime. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. As for today, um, just this will bring everything together of what we talked about the last several weeks um, with training modes or modes of different modes of training. And now we want to talk about the different workout formats, understanding all of the uh, different modes we have talked about. How do we make this as practical as possible? And what does a, a workout program look like on a day, a week, a month, et cetera? Um, and, and this will be a good discussion for us to just kind of ping pong back and forth because um, we I know we have a lot of commonalities, but we also have different populations. And how does uh, programming look depending on, you know, if you have an athlete high level athlete, professional athlete, or if you have somebody who's just, you know, starting training and, you know, maybe is, is a little apprehensive to, to do much. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I do think there's a lot of the same fundamentals in both, but it'll be good to, to see how we can manipulate those different populations. Yeah. 100%. I mean, with that in mind, like, you know, I, I know you did last week on endurance, but mm-hmm. where's, and, and I was fortunate to you know, have been fortunate to watch you practice a good amount. Like where, where do you kind of start with people with programming? What, depending on what the goal is, I know it's, you know, whether it's like you mentioned, you know, people just getting into fitness or, you know, there's some health concerns that people are working around. Like what, what is a typical structure look like for you in a, you know, a strength or, you know, any type of, let's say just in a session, um, what's your structure look like? So, I mean, a lot of times I'll start with the the structure of a squat pattern, a some type of push pattern, some type of like hinge or deadlift pattern, and then some type of pull pattern. And then that that becomes the starting framework. So uh, a lot of times if it's someone brand new, it's some type of sit to stand. It's like a box squat or some type of squat along those lines. And I'm, I'm generally doing it just to assess movement at first, but the you know, the first transition of fitness will be strength training. If it's, it's a new person before I start getting into anything like speed, endurance, um, hypertrophy or anything like that, because strength, as we talked about before is the lowest amount of repetitions. And then it's just a gradual progressive handling of more load, handling of more intensity. Um, but I, but it, it, it doesn't have to be scary. And I might not even use the terminology strength training if it's somebody that's brand new and they, you know, they have some type of uh, apprehension to load and, and resistance. It'll just be giving them the next thing that they can handle. But that tends to be like a starting format that I'll use with a lot of people. Um, and, it, and it does depend on if they're complaining of an injury, but I'm, I'm trying to always keep 
those uh, patterns in mind. Um, and I know you you have a similar you know kind of mindset um, or you know thought process about like assessing those movement patterns at least, um, and then trying to make sure that you get a sense of like. Eat, how, how does somebody pull? How does somebody push? How does somebody hinge? It might not be in the program right away, but we want to have those as at least assessments. And then at some point, get them to do all of those movements. Yeah, 100%. I, I kind of follow a pretty similar, um, you know, pretty similar strategy of, of kind of seeing people move. Like you said, like, those are things that you know, we want everyone to be able to do regardless of your history or your goals. It's like, you should probably be able to do some type of a squat, some type of an upper body push and pull, some type of a hinge, carry, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think on top of that, like I'd add in, you know, an ability to move the spine in some different directions. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's something recently that I've started to look at a lot more just because I think a lot of people come in pretty stiff. So whether that's some you know, side to side movement, or even, you know, thinking like a typical type of crunch pattern, something like that, I think tells a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And even before the movement, just an ability to maintain some type of positioning there. So um, usually I'm looking at and incorporating some type of like anterior core movement. So thinking like a plank or something like that, just because I think it kind of sets up and you talk a lot about like working from the center out. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good way to kind of help people understand what proximal stability kind of feels like. And then that can really easily be translated and, you know, connect the dots into your squat hinges, pushes and pulls. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's usually like the, the fifth carry in, or the fifth uh, category is like some type of what we can broadly consider a core exercise, yeah. but that's going to look very different depending on the person that's in front. And I think I, I'll oftentimes exchange a carry type of movement for a core movement and mm-hmm. you know, depending on the day, just for, for variety or depending on what I think someone would do better at handling initially. Um, so, you know, for example, if, you know, if somebody just has a hard time bearing weight through their upper body, and I know that that might create a little bit of a, a shoulder stress, I might not give them a plank early on, but I'll give them a carry because oftentimes you could really lighten the load on the carry and you can make it, you know, very inviting or very easy for someone to get started with in a way that just changing the orientation of their body might not be optimal for. But I I put that into the same category because you're ultimately trying to control your posture. Um, It tends to be a little bit more static. Even if you're walking with the carry, you can easily turn that into just a stand, like a standing carry instead of a walking version. So, um, but I, I, I put that as like its own categorization. And then the other you know, kind of a uh, way I'll manipulate and, and even to do less categories. And I think that's, that's always useful. Like what are the movements you get the biggest bang for your buck out of? Um, anything that's squat oriented could be for strength, for building leg strength and power, or it could be for building the the depth of the squat, which then ties into multiple joint mobility. Um, but just having some type of categorization of the squat. And then I think broadly trying to strengthen grip if you look at grip strengthening as like this foundational category for upper body strength, I think it, you can include pushing movements, pulling movements, hanging movements, carrying movements, but I would take kind of all of my upper body thought process and just put it into, okay, I got to make sure I'm training the grip. And sometimes I will just have a program set out where I'm not trying to be too specific with the direction of my upper body movements, but I'm just making sure that the the number one focus is grip strength. Um, And that to me definitely incorporates all of the upper body training that is needed, at least for a certain phase of training. And um, if like, and I think that could be quite useful for a lot of clients that are in general population when you don't have to do every, you know, joint motion in the upper body, but just make sure that you're training the grip in various ways. And I think you you kind of check that box of upper body training. Um, and then the third thing would be just getting someone up and down off the ground, which can incorporate upper and lower body training. It can incorporate core, it can inc- incorporate mobility. Um, I think it, it needs to be always systematically done, right? So you're not just randomly throwing people up and down off the ground. You're trying to have some type of sequence that they're getting better with, And then eventually that sequence of, you know, improving their ability to get up off the ground can be 
you know, load is added to it at the end once you you have the certain movements that you've identified that you want to improve with them. But those three categories, squat, grip, get up, that a lot of times that just cleans up uh, a session for me where it's like, okay, I'm just making sure that I'm, I'm checking those three boxes and I feel like I have a very complete program. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of like sets and reps, how you're structuring that, whether you're doing that in like a circuit fashion or one at a time, like how are you structuring that? And, um, you know, what would be your reasoning for, you know, doing a circuit versus doing it one at a time? So that's, and that's a good question. And it's, um, it's often kind of washes itself out depending on how challenging the, the routine gets, but I'll start people in a circuit type of fashion, just especially the sessions that I have a lot of times they're a half hour, sometimes they're an hour, but w- with the half hour sessions, like I don't have as much time to just have people sit and rest between sets. So the next exercise can often become a rest from the previous exercise. So a circuit training fashion, especially early on, tends to work really well because I'm not loading people enough if they're they're new to it that they need a ton of rest between sets. They can often go from one exercise to the next and just the, the variation in exercise becomes the rest. But what I'm starting to notice is as I get people going heavier, they need more rest between sets. And I'm just, you know, always... Uh, I'm I'm definitely cautious to make sure that they understand that they're in control of how long they rest. There is no rush, but oftentimes you can get more in in less time if you do a circuit training fashion. So, I you know I'm a fan of a a superset, a triset, a giant set. Those those type of ideas go through my head. So superset would just be two exercises you're going back and forth with. Triset three exercises that you're you know, sequencing through, and then a giant set would be five. And we we kind of already talked about like how, how would a giant set fit into what we're talking about? Well, it could be squat, push, hinge, pull, some type of carrier core, right? So there's your giant set, five exercises. A triset could just you know be maybe something squat, could be just some one thing for upper body. So it could be squat grip get up, or it could be squat push hinge that day, you know, and just trying to incorporate some of those knowing that you're you're hopefully going to have time with this person that you're working with or if you're training yourself that there's not just one workout in your regimen for the whole week right so if you are deciding that you're going to train a couple of days a week well you can do a tri set and you don't have to incorporate squat push hinge pull and core all in one day you can kind of spread that out throughout the course of the week um so i think it, it really depends on like how many times you're trying to work out and how, how much you're varying it up. But those are the, the t- types of circuits that I tend to start with. And then as things get more challenging or people get stronger, they get more fit. A lot of times it starts to turn like strength training starts to turn into, I'm just doing one movement at a time because I need a lot of break. I can't actually do another exercise. It'll be too much interference for my next set. Um, and you start to respect the rest breaks, which means you have, you need a little bit more time in your training. Mm -hmm. yeah and i think that almost becomes the especially for people working out at home that becomes such an easy and simple way to to kind of program it and make Mm -hmm. it understandable it's like okay pick something from each of these categories and you know probably stick with something for several weeks on end but like you can either do it you know three rounds of it or just be like set a timer for 15, 20 minutes and run through it at a, yeah. at your own pace. And then that kind of auto regulates itself in a way where if someone's feeling good, then they might not need quite as much rest or they can potentially push load a little bit more versus if they're having, you know, more of a down day, then they just build in a little more rest and they still mm-hmm. check the, check the needed box. Absolutely. So the, this type of format that we're talking about, squat, push, hinge, pull, carry, Give me some examples of the different variations that you would Mm -hmm. use for each pattern. So let's start with the squat in, in the gym at home. What are some of the different Mm -hmm. variations that you might see and you might use? Um, I mean, first thing we'll look at with someone is, is probably just the body weight squat in Mm -hmm. terms of an assessment and see where they get to. And then from there, either moving into, you know, potentially a supported squat where your hands are, 
on a bar or on the rack, or if you're at home, like on a counter and see if they're able to actually achieve some more depth if it was initially limited. Um, And if they are, then, you know, oftentimes moving into some type of anterior loaded squat. So that might be like a plate press out squat holding five or 10 pounds. Really the idea of being in all of it, like how can we maximize someone's ability to move up and down in a pretty vertical fashion and get the crease of their hips below their knee crease. Um, I think that that kind of becomes one of our initial goals is just how can we find a good squatting pattern for them? And oftentimes a load in front of them, like a press out or a goblet position is where we start people. Um, From there, you know, depending on the person might move into either a front squat, back squat, safety bar. um, And we'll use boxes a lot too for, people who are new, I think a box squat is great for just helping someone understand and feel the bottom portion of a squat. Mm. And I think too, like for people that are having knee pain, um, or some type of lower body pain, almost starting on the box and working from the bottom up can become a really nice and welcoming variation where you're kind of learning how to actually better put force into the ground, um, by like leaning onto your feet. Um, Mm. And yeah, I mean, those are, those are probably the staples. And then you can always play around with how you're actually using tempo, things like that. But I think the goal with all of it is to build, you know, build the squat to fit the person, as opposed to trying to force the person into a potential pattern that doesn't feel good for them, unless their goals are very specific, like they want to back squat or something. Right. Um, But, you know, I, I think just getting someone to maximize how much they can move up and down. Like they're in an elevator shaft and feel Mm -hmm. good with it is, is like our, our initial goal um, for someone with that. But what about you? I mean, I know you use some similar things, you do some different stuff as well. Yeah. I think like what you said is starting with like a a front loaded or like, I like to think of it as like a centrally loaded squat is oftentimes Mm -hmm. like the first place I'll put load, which looks like a goblet squat. Um, But it, it sort of, it depends if we're working around injury too, or working yeah. around people's thought processes around the squat. Um, that's going to dictate how I even uh, think about using using the squat, right? If, if somebody like has a, an apprehension to squatting, I'm going to almost have to disguise the squat early on to get them to use maybe other parts of their body that aren't their knee, if their knee is the thing that they're worried about. But eventually bring it back to say that that vertical orientation or but it might look a lot more like a hinge at first that, you know, becomes a squat eventually. Right. But in my head, it's like, okay, this is this is the starting point for that squat pattern. And I think that's more on like sort of the rehab side of things. But it really depends on, you know, how deeply ingrained some of these patterns are. Right. So because you know, the, there's, there's not often an end game that like really quickly transitions over to, okay, now you're, you're squatting with load just because we, we got you over this, this apprehension to the knee. It might be, you know, this is the way you squat for a while, but I'm looking at just trying to get any type of movement more towards that, that depth. Um, and a lot of times it's, it is supported with, with people early on with, with that type of apprehensive type of thought process. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll use a wall squat quite a bit too. Um, yeah. and I've, I've started to use that, um, quite a bit more for, for those that like, they're just, they're struggling with, um, the midpoint of the squat, right? So that they'll, they'll be able to sit at the bottom of the squat, but when they go through the sticking point of the squat, there's just an obvious like very vari- variation away from vertical, right? So the, the hips will go high, the head will go down. So just using that squat as a a reference for verticality um and then you can you can load that and you know i've been messing around with using ramps too like sometimes yeah. the the ramp squatting downhill as you know makes it just feel much easier to to keep some verticality um because of it, it basically it's a counterbalance to you falling forward so just seeing like you know what sticks but that outside of what you said those would be the only other things that i think i'm using quite a bit mm-hmm. I, I also think you the wall squat use a like a kind of hack squat against the wall with a foam roller. So like mm-hmm. foam roller behind your back. And that just again, I think I think of it similar to the wall squat. Like it kind of helps people. 
it helps kind of put people into a position where it's almost like mimicking a machine track where like you can only go so far in one direction. Right. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's kind of where I go. What about for you with, with pushing movements or, and pulling movements? Like what are you kind of looking for and where are you usually starting people? So uh, I, a lot of times I'll start people with just like with an assumption that, okay, I, they're not just going to train with me, but what can they do at home and what can they do with limited equipment? So I'm thinking one dumbbell, right? <laughs> like, so with one dumbbell on your back floor press, so it looks like a, like a chest press, like a dumbbell chest press, but instead of being on the bench, you're lying on the floor and you're doing it with a single side so that you can use your other arm as a spotter. And you can also use your other arm to help you get the weight into position. Um, so I, I find I, I start most people there, but it's more of a horizontal press. And then once they can do that with some weight, then I'll take, I'll usually have them try like some type of overhead pushing version with less weight, usually than they, they press horizontally. Um, so those would be the, the two that I'm, I'm looking at early and just trying to build that up. Uh, I have kettlebells in the clinic, so I'll oftentimes exchange a kettlebell for a dumbbell, but if uh, it, I just find like with the adjustability of dumbbells, like that's an easier home tool for people to just buy like one thing, buy your that like the Bowflex adjustable dumbbell, and you could build up your your load for quite a bit before you need to search out more load. Um, so I'm, I'm usually teaching people those dumbbell variations of the push, and then the single arm row, which if you put a knee on a chair or a knee on a, a bench, and one arm is also on that bench, that kind of single arm row variation becomes one of the first pulling motions that I'll show with the dumbbell. Um, if there is like a, a TRX that you, you know somebody has at home, I have a TRX or, or rings. I'll just teach them like a a ring row or a you know TRX row as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I honestly do do the same with people, especially at home. And then if we're we're in the gym, then trying to get some type of probably press and pull often times like I'll go between kind of horizontal and vertical. So thinking like a landmine press, <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. An incline press and then some type of pull down variation, um, whether that's really vertical or kind of more so out in front of them at an angle mm -hmm. and just take advantage of what we have access to in there so that we're kind of exposing them to a range of positions of the upper body. Do you find you um, you you use bands or you educate clients on trying to use bands for their either their gym routine or their home routine? It's been something like I've I've always struggled with figuring out a way to use bands as like to, so you can show objective progress. Um, yeah. But I find like that's an option for home. But the difficulty compared to using a dumbbell becomes. It, there's so many like ways to make a band easier or harder, like just by moving closer, moving farther yeah. away, that it's harder to ob objectify <clears throat> progress, like to make it like, oh, I'm obviously doing more. So it ends up being almost more of a routine, but that it's it's hard to know if you're actually getting stronger. Yeah, I I feel like I don't use them a ton for people if if they're at home and almost more so like if we're using them in the gym, it's maybe like the goal is more so skill than, than load. And then if mm -hmm. we're going to load it more then we just put them on a, a cable or pulley machine yeah, so we can kind of progress it. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's sometimes like the, the beauty of having people in person is just yeah. because it's like, I, I think bands are great and they're better or nothing, but they are so hard to kind of standardize unless yeah. you're like, putting tape exactly where you were last time you did right. it. And like, I, you know, if you cut it, cut the range of motion in shorter, it's going to be easier. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, I, I feel like I don't use it a ton um, as like a main lift essentially. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I, one of the things I think it, I'm finding more utility for the bands is, um, in, you know, with stuff that's more maybe tricep bicep oriented that, mm -hmm. It isn't for teaching a, a broader movement pattern, but when you start to get people into the hypertrophy phases or like you're actually just trying to get people to feel muscles at home, 
um, with like a tricep extension, if you can get the the band to be overhead or you can just kind of like hook it into a door, that's where I'll, I'll tell people like figure out how many reps you can do before it gets too, too hard or you lose your posture. Um, and I think with bands, sometimes that is, is a safer thing to do higher reps with, but it's also yeah. a way that you, you're standardizing it because they're wh- when they start, they're in the same position that they're going to finish. Right. So like you don't have this, okay, every time they pick up the band or go to do the exercise, they might be starting in a different position. So it might be a totally different exercise. If it's, you know, you start with rep one, how many reps does it take you to you start to feel fatigue? Now, the intention is really just to find that that fatigue, that endurance, almost like that working to failure. So I find that bands can be useful, but they don't, they're not great for strength training. They're more better for that feeling of, if, yeah, try to get a little pump in the arm. So I think it's, going to be more like towards hypertrophy style stuff or when you you know people aren't tolerant to like a loaded push yeah and i've i've had people that their shoulders just their anterior shoulders can't really tolerate much load um on a horizontal press or certainly not a, a vertical press so then try a press that press down becomes one of the best things to do and if there's not a rope and cable unit then I'll actually look at increasing the reps earlier than I would with other exercises with tricep press downs, just to get that stimulus. Like if you could feel your tricep working, that's a good thing. So I want you to figure out like how many reps does it take? And then we can, you know, up the colors, change the colors of of the bands to add more resistance. But I found that to be a little bit more successful way of using the band so that it, it does stay a little bit more objective. Like if people are, can obviously tell when they're better, when they're, feeling like they're doing 20, 25 reps with one band. And then we have, all right, we have to give you the the heavier resistance band. Yeah. I think too, like thinking of a, a bicep curl, for example, mm-hmm. it's what's helpful is you're also like your position doesn't change, but you're also just anchored to the band. So like even things where you're not having to anchor it to something external, I think right. helps standardize a little bit. So like, I mean, a band face pull, I was, I was thinking for, or mm-hmm. for example, but then at the same time, like, but you could just move your hands further apart. So um, I take that back. But yeah, I think too, with a, the other beneficial thing for them, thinking of pressing is it's nice because they kind of offload the shoulder a little bit more as you get more into that shoulder mm-hmm. extended right. position, which yeah. could be helpful for someone um, while still kind of feeling that load as they get into that more flexed or, you know, armed, arm straightened position. Absolutely. And I think like bands also play a role in like the the movement continuum ideally we talked about is that they become assistants early on but it's it's almost like you're you're practicing the rep you're practicing the technique so with horizontal or uh, sorry vertical pressing overhead (laughs) pressing um, i find that they could be quite useful if you can anchor the band properly uh, especially the the bands that are more uh they have handles on them and you actually anchor the the band low so your press is going a little bit more or sorry you're anchoring the band higher or like in line with the shoulder so when you you pretend you're doing a press like you'd be holding a weight right at your shoulder and then you go to press it vertically overhead well now if you have a band in your hand and the band is behind you that band assists your arm overhead and then on the way down you get a different type of resistance but you get a resistance that's coming from behind you to have it, you know, to give you something on the way down. So the resistance is different than if it was just the load coming straight down, but it helps you practice the technique of the press. So it's a little bit of assistance and a little bit of resistance, which is again, why it's difficult to objectify the progress from a strength training perspective. But in the grand scheme of movement, like you can think of that's an assisted rep. Eventually we take the band away and now What's harder than an assisted rep, a banded rep, is actually a, a press with no weight a lot of times. And you see this in, in a rehab situation where if you just ask someone to pretend they're pressing a weight overhead with no weight, like you, it, that's actually hard. There's a lot of compensation. The shoulder may shrug, right? You can see from a movement pattern perspective, they need help. They need some type of support, whether it's you passively moving them or the band often cleans that movement up but it does then give them a little bit of resistance on the way down. So it feels like work is being done. 
And I find that to be quite useful. And it's often as a rehab um, after like a shoulder surgery, I want to get somebody to overhead press. Like that is one of my absolute goals, like my end game goals for someone after a rotator cuff repair is that I got to see them like being able to be competent with some load overhead. Like, I think that if you, if you give up before that point, like you haven't really made that person better. Like you, yeah. if, maybe they're in less pain, but that's because they're doing less too. So yeah. I want to see them go through a process that they have some type of proficiency overhead. The banded press is like, I, you could get people doing that really early. And then at least you're looking at something, they're in process. Um, and then eventually it becomes just body weight, like pantomiming or, the the version of the press and adding like small load and then going from there so i didn't really mean to get on a segue about bands but like i just thought like when we're talking about home training that is something that is an option um but it is it's a different discussion than if we have linear progressions with you know dumbbells or kettlebells yeah yeah and i i mean i feel like if you were to get one thing I think a lot of people often get bands as like their first piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. I would recommend just getting, get a single dumbbell. Yeah, and then I agree. Like yeah. Have, have some standardized load. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so then, you know, we can look at the, the hinge patterns. What are um, some of the things that you're looking at there? Obviously it's like, we can also call a hinge pattern sort of like a deadlift. That might be a mm -hmm. more common term for it, but the hinge is probably the more foundational movement because then you can, you know, do different things and not just a deadlift. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I think before even looking at a hinge and it's not really a hinge, but like, mm -hmm. I like to see if someone's able to touch their toes and what that looks like. Yeah. Um, just cause I think that kind of helps us get a pretty general sense of kind of how the tissue in the back of the body can potentially lengthen or not. And then understand where their potential limitations might be, um, when asking them to do a hinge. But then consequently, like, I think if someone has a limited toe touch and like they can't get there, then sometimes a hinge is the first place I right. go to actually improve it at right. the same time. But it's just a baseline where there's not really any school skill to touching your toes. But mm -hmm. um, I think starting people with a hinge, I mean, you know, even looking at something like a back to wall, like pushing your butt towards the wall and letting mm -hmm. your chest fall forward. Um, is somewhere I'll start with a lot of people. I start a lot of people pretty early on in like a kickstand position, which is kind of like a pseudo hinge where, mm -hmm. you know, you're kind of on one leg, um, but it can feel a little bit safer almost than bending over with two legs. I think right. initially, um, but yeah, usually, I mean, that's kind of where I'm starting and then moving pretty quickly to potentially like a kettlebell elevated deadlift, mm -hmm. which eventually becomes a, probably a trap bar deadlift most of the time, just because I think for both of those, your, your, your center of mass is pretty much lined up with the external implement versus yeah. the barbell is kind of in front of you. And I think it can be a little tougher to, to understand, but that's, that's usually where I'm starting with people. Um, what about you? Uh, very similar. So um, if, you know, again, if it, it depends on if like I'm I'm trying to work around symptoms or, or something, but if this is just something we're plugging into a strength training routine, and again, we have just this one implement, this one dumbbell to work on, it's the the dumbbell oftentimes is if you put it up vertically, you don't even need to use like an elevation like because it's already elevated. So a vertical dumbbell um, between the legs deadlift, which could be called a sumo deadlift. That's usually the starting position. Mm -hmm. And I find that, um, clients will find that too easy really quick, which is good. Like I want them to tell me that it's too easy. And then we have to have another discussion about, okay, how do we m create challenge with this hinge pattern with just the dumbbell? So that's where, you know, the, between the legs can become, if they have two dumbbells, more of a suitcase style deadlift mm -hmm. where the dumbbells are outside of the feet and we're hinging down, which is, I, I think, a nice segue then for a trap bar deadlift, which is you're actually entering into the hexagon shape and you're picking up, uh, you know, the one unit, but it like your grip is on both sides of you. Right. So, and I got, I got that question today because I introduced the trap bar deadlift to a client I might have been working with for a while and that we've been doing mostly 
between the legs style sumo deadlifts and suitcase deadlifts. And we sort of been alternating back and forth between those two. And then it became um, just like this obvious progression to, to do the, the hex bar. But she had that question. She's like, what's the difference between the kettlebell? And then I, you know, my, my answer is like when, you know, the barbell is basically one unit you that you have to coordinate where with, if you're doing the suitcase deadlift, you have to coordinate two different kettlebells and that Mm -hmm. that can be not feel that much different or it could be quite a bit different depending on the load and things like that but it's a nice segue like one way or the other if you go from two dumbbells or two kettlebells on the outside then the next thing could be if you have that barbell the trap bar to to go to there Mm -hmm. Um, i think that could be quite useful and then the cat some type of swing right so if the load gets too light in just the deadlift which is a slower movement then then you can start to teach people to add a little velocity with the swing. Dumbbell swings are a little bit more awkward on the grip than a kettlebell swing. So I think kettlebell swings are ideal, but you really can swing anything if you get the, you know, the uh, fundamentals down. So that becomes a nice, you know, segue to from, all right, we did slow hinging, faster hinging looks like swinging that can eventually be different types of cleans or snatches as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you, do you ever notice with people like when you start doing a, a swing that oftentimes I feel like there's a quick revert towards more of like a squat pattern and then and kind of losing that hinge pattern? It absolutely can be. And then and then that becomes, you know, like we're, we're always if we're putting the coach's hat on. Right. We're, we're always assessing that. Like if we we add a different movement, even though if it, it seems like a logical progression, sometimes it's it's not as logical as we think, or yeah. we have to now work on, you know, that pattern more specifically. So if I'm getting people into going from a deadlift to a swing, a, a nice way to kind of bridge that gap is a banded swing where you straddle a band that is tied or fixed to a pillar or a railing. And now the band is right between your legs and it's pulling back because you can get yourself in the exact position you'd want to be at the bottom of a kettlebell swing, but you don't have to go with momentum at that point. The thing about a kettlebell swing is once you get going, you can't, you don't want to slow it down or it's no longer a kettlebell swing, right? Yeah. So the, the weight will kind of pull you down, but with a band, you can set it up in a way where you practice the position of the bottom of the kettlebell swing to be more hingy. And then you can add speed to that um, more rep by rep. So the, the idea of like in that movement continuum is we want to tie into positions and transitions. When we add a movement that there's a speed element to it, sometimes you can't slow it down enough to train the position, but the band allows you to do that. And then you, hopefully when you plug the kettlebell back in, it's there, there's some type of carryover. Mm-hmm. I like that. What, um, what are you, how are you kind of instructing people for, you know, I know we talked about, having one dumbbell at home what if people literally just have body weight how are you kind of recommending people work around some of these patterns and kind of make their environment fit their their structure where they're at physically yeah so we you know one of the things is still the same movements right all right what's what's a body weight squat look like that's hard one you can just manipulate tempo um so just slowing it down um then you can start to go towards one leg so I put a split squat in the category of a squat because it's still more like vertically oriented. So if like, it, but it kind of depends on how you want to define these things. Right. But that's what I would put uh, split squatting more into this, you know, basic uh, progression of a body weight squat and split squatting is quite a bit harder than squatting. And then you can move to one legged squatting, you know, pistol squats, airborne lunges, you know, shrimp squats, things like that. So, um, it absolutely it sometimes it frustrates people because when you start doing that it feels more like a balance challenge than a strength challenge but that's where it's like a a little bit of discussion about like what the feeling the expectation is like you're just trying to get better at a movement and like anytime there's a journey for one right so like if you couldn't do a pistol and now you can you just got stronger even if it felt like you got the pistol because your ankle got more mobile or you got you know, more balance. It doesn't matter. You just got stronger. Like that's, that's how I like to try to define it. 
um, because you, you've now just gained access to something you can do before. Now you can add load to it more over time. And then it becomes more obvious that it's like, okay, I can do this with no weight, which I couldn't do before. Now I can add weight to it. Now as I'm adding weight to it, I'm obviously getting stronger with it. Right. But I think that that becomes how you look at, at body weight stuff. Um, and then you got your push up, right? And there's different ways to to progress your push up. There's different ways to regress the push up because the push up can be very difficult to do one for somebody. Um, and you know, you can obviously elevate the hands. Uh, what I found to be, I think, more a uh, more beneficial lately is just taking yoga blocks, two of them. And there's three different positions of the yoga block. So the high position, the middle position, and the low position, and that becomes a nice built-in progression of just manipulating range of motion, which kind of makes it more like a box squat idea, right? Like you would lo yeah. gradually lower the box to increase the depth of your squat. Here, you're starting with a, one block right under your chest, another one like right under your pelvis or belt area. And you're trying to slowly make contact with both of those blocks as you bring yourself up. And then you could program to, you know, get down to the lowest block position and then eventually take the blocks away. Um, so, you know, just working on good push-ups, right? If you can do a bunch of push-ups, we can definitely make push-ups harder, right? We can work towards, you know, feet elevated, handstand style push-ups, one arm push-ups, right? So then you just have to have a progression for all of those movements. Um, and that's where it's like, if you're not sure, right, you're kind of getting stuck and you don't know how to make something harder and all you can do is do more of something. That's where you, you find a coach and, and you ask some questions. Um, and then I think like the, the hinge could be more, again, one-legged style, can, you can manipulate the tempo. You were talking about the kickstand type of like hinge or staggered mm -hmm. hinge where you're, yeah. you're putting the load more on one leg than the other. I also would think like, and this, these are two different patterns, but I, I'll interchange a, a hinge pattern sometimes for a lunge pattern where there's a stepping forward, stepping backward type mm -hmm. of element, um, which looks a lot like a split squat, but I, I differentiate the two because there's not just a movement vertically. There's an actual like, translation of the body going forward or going backwards. So I put a lunge pattern in sometimes instead of a hinge pattern, which again can add more challenge if you if it's just body weight. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, pull-ups would be TRX, you know, TRX rows or, you know, work on your pull-up, right? Get a, if you don't have a pull-up bar that like you put one in your door frame, there's a lot of different ways to progress the pull-up. We could do a whole different podcast on that, but yeah. just that's for a lot of people, the journey to one pull-up is, is a great strength game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. I do a pretty similar thing. Um, and honestly, finding sometimes at home variations, if all they have is body weight, I'm almost finding things that they need some external support for initially. So mm -hmm. like a pull up is a great example. But, you know, if it's like lunge isn't available to someone, then starting in, you know, a hand supported split lunge and gradually yeah. working towards less and less. Because yeah. um, sometimes body weight is pretty intense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's like, that's an important thing. One thing I've learned in my own fitness and that definitely carried over to my practice is with body weight stuff, like so much of it becomes like, okay, how many push ups can you do? How many pull ups can you do? Right? It just becomes about, you know, doing more, yeah. right? Because it, you like, you don't know how to make it harder. And then you get into the world of gymnastics and calisthenics, and you realize, yeah. oh, there's a lot of ways to make you know the category that you're doing of a movement harder so like trying to figure out if you already can do five push-ups pretty easily how do you make those five push-ups harder right how do you make five lunges hard how do you make five squats hard with just your body weight like seek that out and then that also for me carries over to when you have people that they they can't do one push-up or they they can't do one squat yet like actually become a better teacher in like figuring out that everything is just, again, in this continuum, in this spectrum. Um, but it sometimes it, that the opposite is also true. It's like, well, I don't have any equipment, so I'm just going to do push-ups. I'm going to do 50. Well, now my shoulders hurt, right? Like yeah. when you keep adding reps to something, eventually like you're asking for an overuse problem. But yeah. if you can take that same category of movement and then try to make it harder with less reps, you're building strength, but you're also sort of build, building talent. You're building skill in a way that you you weren't building before because you're just doing more of something you could already do. So yeah. I think that there's a lot of value to that. And it, it ends up looking like gymnastics training um, in different ways. And um, there are plenty of programs out there. Gymnastic bodies is ones that I've followed for a while now. 
that has really been a game changer because I really like the way that they they break things up into like a step by step process for if you're just starting to the, this like crazy end game goal that you may never get to. But I, I love that. Like, I love that. And if you do get to it, then you're like super fit. And there's definitely ways to make it harder. But like, good luck even being there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you you put me on that during COVID. And I <laughs> like I could I it was it crushed me. <laughs> I wasn't it, anywhere close to anything. But it but was you, like but such you a could good have learning gone to the beginning. Right. There was foundations one through oh, foundations yeah. four. Yeah, right? yeah. So there's there's a place for everybody. And yeah. I think it's it was a really good way to see how things that don't look connected can be connected, right? So yep. we talked about like core movements. Well, how something like a hollow body, which is like a you know independent from you know some type of harder gymnastic movement, just looks like stuff that you're doing to work your abs. But as soon as you start to connect it to a front lever, like things start to make more sense. And I felt. Like that, that's where I, I had like a totally different definition of core in my head as a clinician when I started training gymnastics work where it's like, oh, okay, like this, I don't have to use the word core, but like, if I'm thinking about the word core, like a hollow body, why do I like this movement? Because it carries over to something harder. Yeah. And how do I know I'm doing it right? Because it carries over to something harder. Like if I can do the harder thing, now I know I've trained it the right way. Right. And so it's just it was this feedback as opposed to we get in the physical therapy world so bogged down with just like we write exercises down that are supposed to be like core oriented, but they don't lead to anything. Yeah. Right. They're just like disconnected from anything harder. Right. So like I think feel like that type of gymnastics training where you have this harder goal in mind that you may never get to that it really starts to make other easier movements make more sense. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I think, uh, you know, I guess the the last thing to to bring up, like we we touched on different variations of the squat, the push, hinge, lunges, pulls, different carries. Um, you know, farmer carry is one like carry at the side. I do a bottoms up carry a lot of times for for people if if there is a kettlebell where it's just basically you have the kettlebell, you're holding the handle, and the the weight of the kettlebell is above the handle because that loads the grip and it's an easy way to make a lighter kettlebell harder. Um, so I find that to be a quite useful type of carry, but if you have the equipment, you can do a yoke carry where you, you put yeah. a yoke on your back. You can, you can carry a bunch of stuff, but just having that idea be like, you know, head over shoulder over rib cage over pelvis type of thing while you're, you're carrying weights. Yeah. Um, and you kind of figure out how to make that hard on your own. Uh, anything that you found to be kind of like a game changer for you in the, in the carry realm. Not, not really just starting with, like, I think you mentioned earlier, just starting with holds and then working mm -hmm. towards carries and then maybe working towards marches so that you're spending more time on one leg. But, mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't, nothing like that I think is a total game changer other than just progressing duration. And also like you, you've talked a lot about kind of the different ways you can actually grip things, I think. Yeah. Um, and kind of going through that sequence of that is beneficial. Yeah. And one thing I've been uh, doing a little bit more lately, I got these, these like Ninja warrior tools a while ago mm -hmm. that I was just going to train with, with like different pull-ups. So they were spheres, cylinders, yeah. right. Bungees ropes. And I, you know, I didn't realize like I, I thought they were too hard for a lot of my clients but what i, I didn't realize is like oh yeah i could take them off the bar i could hook them onto uh, a kettlebell and they could be a different way to do a farmer carry or i yeah. could put them on you know a, a trap bar and they could be something that you take some weight off of your deadlift but now you have like a totally different grip so now it's a spherical grip versus like the typical bar grip um so just like getting some of those type of implements and if you're, you know, working with people long enough, I certainly wouldn't start there, but, or if you're at home, like I, with a lot of my zoom clients that they don't have barbells, um, and they have pretty much, we've gone through a lot of kettlebell stuff and we want to add a variation to pull-ups or we want to add a variation to even like the suitcase style deadlifts, then we're starting to, I'm, I'm having them pick up these tools and just hook it onto the kettlebells and that they can go lighter there, but it adds a different element of challenge. And then that ties into, you know, what we were talking about with, you know, if you, if you just train grip, you're going to get a lot out of upper body, yeah. right? So like, it just really 
it's big bang for your buck type of thing. So that that's something I hadn't done, you know, my whole career, but just starting to play with that a little bit more like the uh, TRX style rows, the horizontal rows, like you can hook these, the spheres on there, you can hook the cylinders on there. And it just adds a little bit of a, a challenge to, to those movements. Cause they can also be a little hard to progress for in a linear way. Yeah. Um, so like you can, instead of having to move someone more horizontal, you can sometimes just have them manipulate with harder and harder grips. And that becomes the progression over time as well. Yeah. I like that. I haven't played around with that a whole lot, but now I'm thinking of some ways to, to do it. So I'd really like that. Uh, and then, you know, the last thing would be to just talk about like the, the get up style movements, right? So if, mm-hmm. if we are going to just have like this squat grip, get up idea. Um, so three broad categories. And I wrote about this in my, my book is a uh, like Turkish get up style, which is really moving from, you can either think of it moving from sideline to your back to standing with, with or without a weight overhead. Um, but the, you know, the broad way of thinking about it is that you'll be on your back at some point you have to go to an elbow and then you have to eventually get to kneeling and you stand up from kneeling. So there's a lunge incorporated. There's a, you know, bridge variation incorporated. It's upper body weight bearing that's incorporated. Um, And then another categorization would be like a burpee type of thing where it's, you're moving more from a prone position to a standing or jumping position, depending on, you know, like how, how much fitness you want. Um, But in, in those two broad categories there, like you, you actually can see like certain body types do better early on with like a, a burpee style variation. And the burpee doesn't have to be like a CrossFit style burpee where you're popping right up. If, if people don't have that in their game, it could really look a lot like a sun salutation does in yoga where you're starting mm-hmm. on your belly, you know, you're stepping one leg forward, you're stepping the other leg forward. You're teaching people a hinge on the way up, right? You're seeing like what their patterns are. Do they hinge more? Do they squat more on the way up? Are they able to plant their feet, right? So it could just be like this slow way of stretching a lot of things as you go from your belly to standing. Uh, but you're trying to connect. How do you connect fitness to that? Well, if it's it needs to be slow at first and then eventually it can be explosive, that person got a lot fitter in, uh, in that process. Uh, and then the third thing I'll look at is, is rolling to standing, like trying to mm-hmm. use momentum to you can maybe roll to kneeling at first or it, it eventually if you can roll right to standing, you can do... You know, if you're really fit, you can do rolling pistols. You can then, you know, there's a lot of cool movements also on gymnastic bodies where you, how you take the momentum of a roll. Um, and, you know, if rolling to standing becomes easy, you can actually roll and reverse yourself and land in a plank. Um, you mm-hmm. can roll and like invert, you know, and, and do some cool things. But just using the momentum of rolling to, you know, help you up actually becomes a really, really valuable practice. Um, and I've been playing around with this now and with my workouts and, you know, I'm adding load. So, uh, it'll be like rolling to standing will look a lot like rolling right into a goblet squat and then you can add a press. So I'm doing like rolling thrusters now, where I'm rolling right oh, into nice. like pressing the weight overhead. Um, and you, you, know, you can go wherever you want with it, but yeah. the, the bait, the starting position for someone might be just, can they roll on the ground with momentum without like slamming their head down or like without something hurting. Um, So these ideas of getting up and down from the ground, like they're absolute like killer from a fitness standpoint when you can do them well, but in the process of getting someone to just do one again, like you've really done a lot for, for someone if they couldn't do that before you started that process. Right. So again, big bang for your buck. If you're someone who's a little bit more like they can do that, no problem. They can get up from the ground. All right. Add a little load, add a little challenge to it. To me, the most metabolically active thing you can do is train getting up and down from the ground in a progressively harder fashion. Because if you think about it, if you're doing it with load, you're moving that load the greatest distance, right? Like you'd be going from the ground to standing and then you can jump. You could put the the thing that you're lifting overhead, right? Like there's the greatest distance to move a load. So there's Mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that can happen in one rep. Yeah. Yeah. Those are especially, I mean, the get ups, it's like, doing a single one of those is, is a lot. So, yeah. um, but I think that's, that's such an invaluable pattern and, you know, breaking it up to start for most people, like you kind of described is often a really good starting place. Absolutely. All right. Anything you think we missed? I think I wanted this to be a, uh, you know, a way of summing things up. So it's a little longer conversation, but hopefully um, it, it provides some practical ways to utilize what we talked about in weeks uh, before 
you know, just to, to remind you know, the listener about like the way that we would still think about using the, these formats a lot of times is strength first, right? Because it tends to be slower reps, or we can think of it as just like slower reps, not as many reps first, then build into maybe some things that you add a little bit of speed, which looks like power training, then, you know, add speed in a way that looks like speed, which would be like get a bunch of reps in, in a, a certain amount of time. Um, which then could also tie into some hy- hypertrophy style stuff, which uh, you know, density type of training stuff, which we talked about before. And then the last uh, presentation I did was on endurance training and where you could fit that in. Uh, I think endurance training, a lot of times, like people are already good at that, which, you know, can be doing like we were ju- already talking about. It's like, if you can do body weight stuff, you can already do, you just do more of it. Well, there's, there's mm-hmm. times for that. But I often feel like I have to pull people sometimes away from endurance training and put them into strength training or power training first um, Mm -hmm. as a way to create variation. But if you are someone who already is, you know, pretty well versed in your training program and you feel like you're getting tired in your sport endeavor or, um, you you know, you like you you have a competition where it's like, I want to see how many pull ups I can do or something like that. Then I think you, you put endurance training into that that realm. Um, with at least with you know the some of the movements that we're talking about here yeah yeah 100 all right so next week we'll we'll switch gears a little bit maybe we'll we'll take some questions for the audience again I, i'd like to get back into discussions about um different injuries and um, stuff like within the, the physical therapy realm that we might be able to have some a good discussion about some of the things we have a little bit of beef with and you know kind of riff off of that like some misconceptions yeah. that are out there um so that's where i'm visiting the next couple of weeks going yeah looking forward to it all right great i will see you next week see you then